Game of Thrones Season 4, Episode 9, the penultimate episode of the season, The Watchers on the Wall, directed by Neil Marshall, who also directed... Blackwater? Yeah. Yeah? (laughs) Yeah, that's the one. I know. That's why I said it. Is he coming back for Season 8? I'll check my sources. Okay. Hey, Dan? I'll check my sources. Uh, Teddy? (laughs) You got Wikipedia up? (laughs) But this episode, overall, it's one of the best cinematic experiences that you're going to get from the show, and we mentioned the same director as Blackwater. Just talk about how they're blurring the line. We talk about it all the time, but just touch on it for this episode specifically, that they're blurring the line between cinema and television expertly. Well, yeah, it's a beautiful episode. Everything from the fight choreography to some of the shots here are beautiful. There's one in particular of, it's an overhead of showing the wildling camp south of the wall, panning over Castle Black to the wall and to beyond the wall, which is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of great shots here. Again, John standing on top of the wall, and especially the character moments. Every time you see these big episodes, these big battles, much like Blackwater, it's the character moments that make the episode from really good to great. A nice battle sequence is always fine, and it's always great to watch, but the stakes they are able to build, not only throughout the whole season and the series in general, but in that episode alone with the small, smaller moments really make it something special. Yeah, and this episode begins with a smaller moment with John and Sam talking atop the wall after they were sent there by Alistair in the previous episode as sort of a punishment. And here they're talking about their experiences throughout the seasons with love. And Sam is kind of pushing John to tell him more about Egret. It's when you know that your friend had, you know, when your friend does the, does the deed. Yeah. You're like, come on, give me, give me the deets. I mean, we're adults here. You can just say fuck. He inserted his penis inside yes. of Egret's <laughs> vagina. Yes. Sixth grade health, man. Come on. Mr. Smalley, shout out. Yeah, but he's asking about it. And he's like, oh, what do you want to hear? It's like, oh, better feet. Sam and Rex Ryan would be great friends. Yeah, Sam's got a foot finish. <laughs> yeah. How big were her feet? But it is funny how John is that he can't describe what happened between. What, what is he supposed to say? She was she had red hair. She was very pretty. She was a wadling. Did I mention that? Could have been like a, a nice little, um, like, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> Just fucking jump the shark. Fuck it. Just I'd like to see movie. a Game of Thrones musical. For a little... For a little while, you're more than just you. You. Well, I don't know. I'm not a bleeding poet. No, you're really not. Sam is talking about how the vows of the Night's Watch are ambiguous, that they're up for interpretation, that they never specifically say you can't have relations with women. They just say no wives, no children. Yeah, he's trying to find some loopholes, but I think we talked about it last episode where where how having a relationship with a woman can affect your judgment and maybe not be the best position for someone at the wall where Sam wants to abandon Castle Black to go save Gilly when that's not the plan. You see that even just with family, how John left to go save Rob. It just creates an unneeded distraction when the mission at hand is to defend the wall. Yeah, this is this is the episode where we get the line from Eamon, where he says that love is the death of duty. But then it transitions to the Wadling camp, and we have Egret. And throughout this season, that she's had this new rage inside of her because of John's portrayal, that she's been so committed to killing people south of the wall, just as a way to get back to John. It's almost spite now. It's not about the problems that the Night's Watch and the Wildlings have had for thousands of years. It's personal. Yeah, and she takes that out on Tormund, like, questioning his story. I believe Tormund. Then is the man with a wolf. I know you never fucked a bear. You know you never fucked a bear. Right now, I don't want to think about the bear you never fucked. We're going to need some sources for that. Think he'll lie about something like that? I yeah. like the theories, too, that it was Liana Mormont's mom, that he fucked a bear, because uh, Bear Island. Oh, okay. And that Liana's his daughter. Big Daddy Then questioning her about John and why she let him go and things like that, and she gets very defensive right away. She said, uh, she makes it known that no one can kill him besides her. You have, you have Mance Raider bringing all these tribes together. They don't all like each other. <laughs> know what I think you do when you see him? Serve him up a nice, juicy slice of ginger mint. <laughs> well, you've been thinking about that ginger mint. No, <laughs> yeah, and that's at the end of the episode when John says if we kill Mance Raider, then they'll scatter. Mm-hmm. Because he's the one that keeps them together. But the Thens are just assholes. And at this point, they shouldn't trust Egret. Because even when she sees John in this episode, she hesitates to kill him. So she's a weak link. Even though she has been killing more than the leader of the Thens, more than anybody there. What if she does hesitate for that split second, and that's the difference between them winning and them losing? Well, you think about it, if John goes down, they really don't have a leader on the floor, you know? Yeah, yeah, no. Well, Janos would have came out. 
Oh, yes. Okay. He did lead the city watch, so. That is true. He was commanding the city watch when John was in Pampers. Yep. He was doing the shit where you were shitting in Pampers. Oh, and we see a nice little shot of Gilly sneaking on by. A little close for comfort, right? Yeah, she kind of looked like um the sand people in Star Wars. <laughs> Looking for R2-D2. <laughs> I think she's like waiting, like, uh, hopefully they get into a big skirmish so I can sneak by without no one noticing me. Yeah, I think so. And play me off, Johnny. Well, they're like, like, when I was talking about that overshot, overhead shot before, they're like really close to Castle Black. I think they might even know they're there. I don't think they're like trying to hide. It's like. Oh, yeah, they know they're not coming out. Yeah, and then she returns to the wall, but before that, we have this scene with Maester Raymond and Sam. And this scene almost made me cry. When you hear an older person reflect on their childhood and their youth, talking about lost love, and even when he says, I was in love once, and Sam has that reaction, you were, that sometimes when you see somebody who is that old, that you can't picture them as a young man. The worst part of being old is that you're still young. I don't love her. Yes, you do. No. Yes, you do. Heard it in your voice when you first brought her to me. I remember how it sounds. I was in love once. You were? You can imagine all manner of horrors befalling that poor girl and her child. Is it so difficult to to imagine that an old person was once more or less like you? I still feel that way. Like fucking. When I was watching this, I was like, yeah, when you're old, you just long for that youthful energy to run, to jump. I'm 25. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Why am I longing for these things? Crazy, man. I feel like I'm an old fucking Get up in the morning right my back. See these young whippersnappers walking around, you know, out and about. I remember my first love in second it's grade. Like, I used to be you. <laughs> it's like, sir, this is a Subway sandwich shop. Sir, I'm 23. <laughs> it's a nice moment. I mean, you have Sam trying to read up on the wildlings. He's kind of, he doesn't really know what to do in this situation. He's not, you know, a fighter or anything, so... He's trying to put his mind to work. But Eamon kind of, he knows how Sam is thinking about Gilly right now. He knows how he feels. Even though he's blind, he can still hear it in his voice and just get that sense about him. And hearing Eamon talking about his past, it's kind of crazy because he should have been, he could have been king if he didn't join the Night's Watch. I mean, he was next in line before Aegon, right? So it's kind of a situation where he put his duty against, I guess, vanity or wanting to be in power. And he was talking about how since he was such a suitor for the throne, he would have women basically throwing themselves at him, and but only one stuck in. And it's kind of sweet how he still remembers the face. Yeah, it is. And he talks about, too, he's almost bragging in this scene about what he was. You know who I was before I came here? What I could have been if I'd only said the word? Of course you do. I met many girls when I was Aemon Targaryen. And I think he's obviously a student of history. He knows how love, how the conflicts between brother and sister destroyed, almost destroyed his family, and eventually did, that he knew his best bet was to get away from this rather than have to come to a point where you betray somebody that you love for the throne. He knows what that does to people. But yeah, hearing him describe the features of the girl that he was once in love with, it is heartbreaking. And there's a scene too in the show when he's dreaming that he was young or he wakes up and he says, egg, I had a dream that we were old and it's heartbreaking. I never got that. How like these third in line, fourth in line sons, you know, you're not going to be Lord or King, but go to the Citadel, Night's Watch. Well, you still get dragged in. I kind of just put my feet up, like, all right, it's best of both worlds. I have a sick-ass name. I got the Targaryen name on my back. Chilling in King's Landing. Put my feet up. I don't have to do anything. Well, this world makes you make that. go to the Citadel and learn. Sounds boring. I'd like to be a macer. Macers seem to, they never get killed. (laughs) They're always like, you're my macer now. Tell Tell your macer he works for me now. (laughs) Yeah, and at this point, Sam thinks that Gilly is dead. So Eamon is almost comforting him, telling him about his lost love, that she didn't die, but he was forced to give her up because of the life that he chose. And then when Sam notices that Gilly is at the front gate, he starts screaming at Pip. And Pip doesn't deserve that. Pip's just doing his job. I like Sam, though, being a little assertive. He is. He's very manly in this episode. The form gave me strict orders to not open the gate. Oh, Pip, open the fucking gate! Samuel Torley's. <laughs> you kiss hearts, Bane, with that mouth? <laughs> yeah, but then that's when we hear the two blows of the horn showing that the wildlings are here. The largest fire the North has ever seen. Pretty big. No way to know that. I mean, there's probably pretty big fires. I think he was talking about the fire when Melisandre kills him. Oh. Yeah, that's the fire. 
Okay. Just didn't know he'd be in the center of it. One of my favorite moments of this episode is this scene between John and Alistair Thorne, and I talk about it all the time, that I love when enemies come together. Bigger Jaws. Such a cliche, but I love it every time. Yeah, and especially with these two characters, because there has been such an intense animosity between them. And Alistair admits that, yeah, we should have flooded the gate. But the lesson that John learns here, this lesson in leadership, that leaders cannot question themselves because once they do, it's over for them and it's over for all the men that they lead. Do you know what leadership means, Lord Snow? It means that the person in charge gets second-guessed by every clever little twat with a mouth. But if he starts second-guessing himself, that's the end. For him, for the clever little twats, for everyone that even if you don't know what you're doing, you have to give off that air of confidence. This is probably the most respect that he's had for Thorne in this moment. Yeah, it sheds some light on both of their characters. And just to go back, that shot of John looking over, so Ooh, great. Oh, that's a good shot. So Might great. be the thumbnail. Uh, I don't know. Good. There's a couple of good shots to pick from. I think it'll probably be John holding eager. Alistair does prove himself to be a great leader in this episode. No, he, I love Alistair. a good wartime leader. Love Alistair in this episode. It just shows, like, yeah, I mean, they might not have seen eye and eye before, but we got to put that aside. <laughs> Take a look, John. Demise is imminent, so we need to do something. We need to stick together. And Sam, too, in this episode, that he is very manly when he goes to hide Gilly, and he had just told her, wherever you go, I go, but I have to go real quick. And Gilly tells him, you're not going to be any use up there. <laughs> just stay down here, cuddle, we'll talk, we'll tell stories, we'll have a good time, you and little Sam. I hear Janos is coming over later, too. So it's a party. Should I bring another plate out? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and Sam tells her, listen, I made a promise, and the writing here is perfect. When he says, I made a promise, I have to keep it because that's what men do. And Gilly says, well, then promise me you won't die. Eh, it's a little hard of a promise, but yeah, he shows bravery. He's kind of this new Sam that we're seeing. He's very confident in himself, and he wants to fight. He wants to go out there with his brothers and musters up some courage, gives Gilly a nice little kiss. Oh, yeah, first moment. Yeah. Ooh. We're just friends, Sam. <laughs> you're like a really, you're like my brother. Did I misread this? <laughs> you're not only a brother of the Night's Watch, you're a brother of mine. It's like, but you named your, your son after me. Yeah, like a, like a, like a, that was a gesture. Like a grandpa that died. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I promise you, I won't die. In this conversation that he has with Pip, he reiterates that he now has somebody to fight for. And Pip asks him, But if you're afraid of a band of wildlings, how in seven hells did you manage to kill a white walker? I wasn't Samuel Tarley anymore. I wasn't a steward in the Night's Watch or son of Randall Tarley or any of that. I was nothing at all. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people when they're put in these situations. It's, it was one of those situations with the White Walker. And we talked about this last episode, too, that he had the proper weapon to kill the White Walker, that a Then is probably scarier. Yeah. I, <laughs> Pip is terrified, man. And I would be, too. I mean, every time I watch, like, these crazy battle sequences or even in a, a movie like uh, Hacksaw Ridge, where at any second, snap and you're dead. And you don't even know what's coming and, and you don't even, you can't do anything about it. Scary stuff, man. I would be fucking... I'm genuinely curious to how I would react in this situation. Would I be Pip or would I be Sam? Well, everyone's would just... my adrenaline get me going so much that I'm just ready to fight, or would I be the scared, cowering person? Well, especially in Westeros, everyone's conditioned to crave battle, to get the glory, to fight for your house, fight for honor. Like, it's kind of a die with a sword in your hand. It's kind of honorable in a way. But in reality, you're just getting... <laughs> People are just telling you that's so you were dumb enough to go fight. It's a tough situation, but especially when you have 100,000 wildlings breathing down your fucking neck. Yeah, and the wildlings begin to storm the wall. I think at that point, it's kind of like, all right, death is inevitable. I might, might as well just go out swinging. You know, it's not... Right, that's what I think, too. But then I have dreams where I'm in war, and I'm terrified, and I'm hiding the whole time. I had a dream a couple weeks ago oh, I'm where... playing dead as soon as shit hits the fan. Well, that's get what some, Sam's kind of doing. Get some of Pip's blood on me, I'm like... Yeah, I'm dead, too. Ah, you pretend you're a zombie. <laughs> That's how Bill Murray did in Zombieland. Yeah, that'd be funny, Bill Murray, just in the Army of the Dead. <laughs> but then the wildlings begin to storm the wall, and this might be my second favorite Alistair line. Actually, you know what? It's my first of the episode, when he's yelling at all of them to prepare their arrows, and he's like, I said knock, you fucking cunts. Does knock mean fucking draw? Oh, Does fucking all mean fucking drop? No, no sir. sir! You're planned to die here tonight? No, no sir. sir! That's very good to hear! Draw! 
what we were just talking about, that if I had a commander like this who was pumping me up, because I always responded with coaches, I don't know how it would it would be in battle. But when they yell at you, when they dig into you, when they make it personal, I'm ready to go. And Alistair, even John here, he's like, no, sir. And the Wadling group that's led by Tormund and Egret, they come from the south and they're attacking the south wall of the castle. And this is a surprise to all of them at the Night's Watch because I guess John kind of told them that they were there, so they should be expecting this. How about Egret with this bow? She's like me and Tilu when we used to play back in the day in multiplayer. Ooh. <laughs> Ducking, she's dodging. Oh yeah, she's definitely killing it right kill, now. That's a hell of a kill streak. This is one I like when they do the shots and like they let the arrow like they they just show it from their vantage point at going through the air. I don't know for some reason I kind of like those shots. Yeah, they get news. Alistair has to go down. He gets slint the wall because that's always a good idea, right? Oh, slint is just he's the best in this episode. Such a coward. But Alistair, like again, they're showing out leadership skills. He goes right down and he's right in the fucking fray. Oh yeah, once he hears that they're storming the castle, he's like, well, I have to lead the defense. Mm-hmm. I have no choice. I'm the commander here. And Slint, I think this just proves that commanding the City Watch is nothing. No. It's uh, it's almost an honorary title. Yeah, like vice president. Kind of, yeah. It's just good for your resume. Yeah, he goes down. Even later in the fight when everything's going on, he looks at Tormund. Tormund's absolutely fucking bowling through their ranks. And Alistair's like, I'm going to go fucking take this guy out. Yeah. He I says, res- respect the hell out of that. He's he like, leaves the battle that he's in to go one-on-one with Tormund. Yeah. Who was running through Castle Black like the Tasmanian Devil. I love the one shot where it's the tracking shot and he's just like, ha 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 Just randomly screaming. He it's was like, having a hell of a time. It's like prison. You see the biggest guy and you square up. And Thorne, I mean, just to skip to that board, uh, just to skip to that battle, he holds his weight against Tormund. That was impressive. Yeah. I didn't know who the hell I was rooting for. I think I was rooting for Thorn. Yeah, at that I point. Was, yeah. Because you just seen this guy fucking ravage two towns, kill all these innocent people. You're not sure about him. You know, and Thorn with that moment with John, you're like, oh, I could see where this guy's coming from. Now he's out leading. He's fucking got the troops on his back. Yeah, he gets a little, he gets a little diced up, but hey, he held in long enough. Very commendable fight. Right. You get injured like that, you have the right to go into the barn. He is a knight after all. And even Pip here with the crossbow, not really doing much. <laughs> Did you get one? No. Oh, shit, Pip! Shit! Sam. Yeah? I think we're gonna die. Uh, if you keep missing, we will. What about Sam, though? I mean, I guess he just loads. I- I'd take that job. Yeah, he doesn't do anything. Just load the crossbow. It's like yelling at Pip. It's like, oh, you want to get up here and take some shots? No, I didn't think so. Give me a bow. <laughs> Well, Alistair Thorne, too, he gives one of the best rallying speeches when he talks about how the Thens, that they eat the corpses of the men that they kill. Do you want to fill a Thens belly tonight? They're like, no. No, we don't. We wouldn't like that at all. All right, let's fight them then. He knows how to speak to his audience. Yeah, it's absolute madness down there. And then back on top of the wall, Gren does a great job. He's getting slint the hell out of there. Yeah, he does. (laughs) He's like looking over. He's like, all right, this guy's a fucking joke. What was that? Oh, you guys need Jano slint down there? I did leave the city watch. They probably need me. <laughs> we can't just let them attack the gate! The bars of those gates are four inches of cold rolled steel. Those are giants riding mammoths down there! Do you think your cold rolled steel's gonna stop them? But even before that, too, when he's just panicking and John is trying to talk some sense into him, one of my favorite lines, those are giants riding mammoths down there. It's so absurd. And I think that's what's so great about the show, even going back to Pip and Sam's conversation when they're talking about the White Walker. This situation right now feels so real that the White Walkers feel like something that don't even exist in this world. Seeing these giants on mammoths, where did the mammoths come from? I have no idea. <laughs> right? It's pretty awesome, though. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice little touch of fantasy. Maybe he gets slint out of there, he cowers, he goes hides with Gilly, and they give John the wall, which probably should have done in the first place. Right, well, you can see him, he's kind of eyeing down the position throughout the, the whole build-up to this moment. It's like Aaron, Aaron Hall. Right, yeah, the wall is Aaron Hall. Yeah, every, everyone, gets, everyone gets a... Even Ed. Ed gets a taste. Lord of the Wall. I see you, Ed. And I don't know why, but every time they show the giant shooting that big-ass arrow, it gets me every time. That man said, stand the fuck back. <laughs> the first guy shooting the arrow before the giant makes it so much better. That's like a fucking heat-seeking missile from oh that giant. Oh, my God. It's What's fucking... the purpose of climbing the wall? You get to the top, and they're just going to stab you in the head. Wildly. Well, it's like the same thing. When Stannis was storming King's Landing, they put the ladders up. Yeah, but the wall takes... <laughs> Yeah, you know. like, like two hours. They were they were they were moving, man. They were moving. It's what they even say. It's like when John before was like, "Oh, they won't be up till dawn." I made the climb, and like, yeah, but you weren't in any hurry. Like, yeah, that this, is true. This is in war, man. They're in a rush. One of my favorite shots too is a random shot of a character that we I don't think we ever see again. This actor, but when all the chaos is going on downstairs and they go into the kitchens, and you have that one cook with the butcher's knife against his back, and oh. he just walks up. <laughs> He's gonna spin off. 
He really should. <laughs> I want to spin off that leads right into that moment. It's a whole history with him and that butcher's knife. Throughout all the madness, we see, you know, go back to Pip and Sam, and Pip catches one. He does. He catches one body. This is like me in Call of Duty, where I finally kill somebody and then I die right away. die right away. (laughs) Yeah. It's my life story. I wasn't expecting that when I first saw it. I'm like, come on, Pip. You're okay. Even Sam's like, oh, Mason Raymond's coming. I just want him to be like, yo, bro, there's a fucking arrow through my neck. I'm not (laughs) surviving. Mason Raymond's like standing right there. Yeah, I can't can't patch that up. (laughs) We'll put a bandage on that. Get get back in the game. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Rub some dirt on it. It is very sad, though, this scene, because it's Pip and it's also Gren in this episode when Gren has to hold the wall against the giant. You're not expecting these characters to die because they're John's supporting characters. And it is emotional that Pip says earlier in the episode that he doesn't belong here. And it's always sad when you have to comfort somebody that is, what do you say? It's just so hard. Tried your best. At least you tried, Pip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you said, John uh, sends Gren to guard the gate because they know the giants are coming and leading up to that the way that they kill mag the mighty oh well, yeah. mag the mighty is the one who storms it uh dongo is the one who dies the graybeard giant they get rid of the mammoths too with the barrels of oil yeah i love their like defense tactics they have the barrels of oil they have the, the fucking scythe. the archers that go perpendicular oh, yeah. to the to the ground it's pretty crazy and they have the uh yeah that big ass fucking anchor that comes across <laughs> yeah pretty dope which is another thing when the hell did they build that it came with the property. Right? Yeah. They had to time that perfectly. <laughs> but it is funny to watch that giant run after the mammoth. Like, where are you going, buddy? <laughs> we still got to fight these guys. He gets one right through the heart, and that just pisses Mag the Mighty off. He says, you know what? Fuck this. I'm opening this gate by myself. Yeah. Do you like the fact that they cut away from Gren and the brothers fighting the giant? I kind of do. There's going to be some epic fucking clash in a tunnel. Them just crawling over him and stabbing him. (laughs) Yeah, I kind of like it. It kind of builds mystery. And it makes that last shot when they go see the dead giant and Gren and the rest of the crew. It's kind of sad. Like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Gren timed that speech perfectly. It's like, if I I have to start saying this speech now because we're not going to finish by the time he gets here. It is a good moment, though. Going out, Gren goes out swinging against a giant. And it's so funny watching him back in the earlier seasons when he was an enemy of John, mm-hmm. when they would have when they were fighting each other. And then he knows that he's going to die, but he still takes that command like a brother of the Night's Watch. And he willingly sacrifices his life, because if they fail, it, it is over. It's, yeah, it saves the day for them. Kind of like for Gren, though. You're like, oh, John, I thought we were friends, man. <laughs> yeah, you can't send uh, Ed. Hold the gate. If they make it through. They won. I'm sure Ed could hold it. I forgot the name of the guy in the books, but Gren's still alive, so. Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right, I'm not, I'm not as sad anymore. We were disappointed in Sam that he wasn't doing much to help Pip, but here he, he is the first man, I think they say in thousands of years, to kill a White Walker and a Fen. That's another cinematic cliche. Him bumbling with the crossbow. Yeah. But it's still awesome. No, it's great. It's like a Elias Sports Bureau like stat. Like, <laughs> oh, first player in the past 10 years to kill both a Fen and a White Walker. Within the same month. What does that prove? Proves that Sam is very lucky. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers, sabermetrically, Sam's probably the most fearless killer in all time. He's like Boban. His per 36. <laughs> but he can't get on the floor. <laughs> yeah. That's a problem with Sam. <laughs> yeah, he puts it right between the eyes, though. And then he goes and gets John. He's like, hey, John. You got any men to spare? <laughs> yeah. It's like you guys are just standing up here yelling at the... <laughs> Yeah, what are they doing on top of the wall? I feel like they are so not helping. They're throwing the barrels. They have the <laughs> anchor. They're shooting some arrows. We need to kill the, the seven people that are trying to climb up the wall. <laughs> not as fun. Well, it's kind of like crazy because it's, it's all scoped here. If you're just watching, like, oh, why are they just attacking Castle Black? Why don't they climb the wall like 30 miles that way? But in the books, they explain, like, they're, they're going all over the place. They're going to the, uh, yes. East Watch, and they're, they're taking all the towers and they're spread out and john doesn't even fight in the book he just kind of he fights but he's not mobile his leg is still pretty so 103 injured. at castle black but there are there are spread out right and they do their best but they kind of just put the focus here in castle black which you have mind. to do yeah but that is great when john hands the key to sam who tells him at first i don't want you out there because i need him more than i need you and that boy goes man when he comes out whoo 
He's like, finally. Very dangerous. As we've seen from Grey Wind, arrows can do some damage to a Or a sword wolf. when he's not paying attention. Yeah. It is dangerous. But at that point, yeah, if you have a fucking dire wolf, you got to use him. Yeah. Very unnecessary jump here by John. Hey, he wants to get on the field, man. It does look cool. And going back to when he gives Ed the wall, awesome. Ed's like, I guess it's my turn to yell, knock, and loose. Uh, what were they yelling before? Knock, loose. Tr- no, what? what, what, what Come on, Ed. This is your big moment. I think it's noose. No, that's what's a noose? Hmm. All right, fuck it. I'll just go with shoot the, the fucking arrows. Yeah. <laughs> Light the fuckers up! No! No! Yeah, John comes down and he's ready to fucking go. And I think this scene, this episode proves that. Yeah, I think you can position him as one of the top five swordsmen in the show, not in the book. In the book, I think it's it's stated that he's above average, maybe good. He's still young. Right, but he's tier one in the show. Yeah. Because he's tap dancing on everybody. And even when he begins to fight the Then. Well, before that, let's talk about one of the best tracking shots of the 21st century. It is. You're getting all the different angles of the battle where it begins with John, but then you get Tormund, like I talked about before, that he's just running rough shot through everybody. Then it even goes to Egret, where she's still taking everybody out with the bow and arrow. And I forget where it ends. Does it end with John and the Then? I think so, because then they, yeah. get, they get into their skirmish. and. But it's great to get just all the different angles of this battle, where it's just not the main characters. It's showing how it's affecting all these secondary red shirts, mm-hmm. that it is absolute chaos and mayhem. It's a massacre. And even a shot that we forgot to mention before, when the giant does shoot the bow and arrow, and it lands in the middle of the courtyard oh, yeah. of Castle That's Black, dope, yeah. and somebody looks at it like, what the fuck? Wait. And then he just goes right back to fighting. How the fuck did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's a great tracking shot by Neil Marshall. And the cinematographer for this episode. When he takes John's head and bangs it off like the fucking... That's a concussion. Oh, yeah. You gotta... Stop He's not s- getting up from that. Stop the play. Bring him into the tent. <laughs> we gotta, Evaluate him. We got a protocol here, all right? We don't want to get sued by the Players Association. Uh, <laughs> and it's I think- a very elegant fight, too, even from the Then, who somebody who's just kind of a butcher. He's got this giant axe. But the way John is parrying with him, yeah. it feels like a fencing match. <laughs> Yeah, and it's pretty funny, too, because I think someone commented when we did the Carl Tanner, Jon Snow fight. Yes. And we were talking about, like, the difference between the honorable John and, you know, the non-honorable Carl Tanner, and he spits at him, and John learned something. And we say he kind of, the way he stabbed Carl in the back of the head, he kind of learned in that moment. Like, it's not always the most honorable that wins. Sometimes you got to bend the rules, and he does the same thing that Carl did to him to defend. Yeah, because right now he's not the favorite. <laughs> He's the underdog in this fight. Well, favorites Emma Stone and Rachel Wise. That is true. Well, I think it's going to be Rachel Wise. Um, I think she's going to beat her out. Pulling for Emma. Yeah, well, John, like you said, he learns to fight dirty in a matter of a couple of weeks. And just to, the way that the fight is choreographed, I, it's a very elegant fight. I Going into this, I had known that Jon Snow was going to die in the series at some point. And I thought it was this. I thought this was going to be the scene where he dies. I was genuinely scared for this man's life. And when he survived, I was like, oh, he probably never dies. Today was not the day he dies. <laughs> yeah. And then he sees Egret. Yeah. And like you said before, the hesitation. This is like when your girl's watching you at practice, so you go extra hard. <laughs> and Egret's like, damn, I can't shoot this man. He's balling right now. <laughs> I got to let him live. <laughs> Give him one last look at the goods. <laughs> both stop in their tracks. Just, they're both frozen. What do you think would have happened if Ollie wasn't? I think Egret might have killed him. Yeah. Out of just pure rage, and then she would have done what Jon Snow does for her, where she would have ran over and held him. And I think Jon would have respected it. It's like, damn, you're turning me on right now <laughs> as I die, as I lay here. What do you think? I think so, too. I mean, I think something's bound to happen. We're talking about the chaos. You know, they're not going to be sitting there fucking looking at each other for too long before someone else intervenes. So I think that was inevitable. <laughs> I love Ollie, too. He's like, that head nod. It's like, did I do good, John? <laughs> <laughs> he like thinks he just saved the day. Like John's gonna like, oh, he's gonna give me a raise. Like, well, I guess we finally Blame get some Sam. validation to his claim, saying he's the best archer in his camp. That's yeah, not him. He's a hard scoper. That's yeah. not a quick scope. You know how long he was aiming at Egret? <laughs> it's like right there, right there. Got her. He held the he held the left stick too long, so he ran out of breath. So <laughs> yeah, his arm is getting weak. A little, yeah. So I gotta redo it again. Yeah, and it's it's. Blame Sam. Told Ollie to grab a weapon. Find the weapon, Ollie. Fight them. Yeah, and it's a nice moment they share. I mean... Oh, it's a nice moment? It's a horrifying moment. 
Well, when he's holding her, it's... it's oh, yeah, it's, it's real nice. It's not, like... They're gonna go back to the cave. For the fucking circumstances they're in. I mean, obviously, it's not, like, the ideal situation, but she has a fucking arrow in them, so they gotta share a moment, and I thought it was a nice moment. That war was so brutal, but when I watched my lover die in my hands... <laughs> This made it all okay. <laughs> they weren't going to have a happy ending. You know, she's fucking with the army that's going to fucking co- try to kill you, and you're trying to kill them. You weren't going to fucking... It's an inevitable ending. Yeah. That's what makes it so sad. But it's kind of it's kind of beautiful in a way, you know? It's them no, coming it is, together. Yeah. yeah, so fuck you. Why don't you gotta come at me like that? What she says, too, when you know, we should have stayed in that cave, it's just a situation that never was going to... It's a relationship, it's a love story that was never going to work. We'll go about that. And I think this ending for Egret is an improvement over the books, because in the book, John just kind of stumbles across her body at the end of the battle among all the corpses. George sometimes makes his writing too realistic, mm-hmm. where this is, oh, Jon Snow, of course, the last person that he's going to see is the person that he loved. It's, it's too coincidental, but it works. I think even George said when we went to go see him, like, he likes to take stories, but he likes the more the more entertaining, the more juicy stories, and he uses those, right? So it's kind of like when you, it's like this route was the more entertaining, the more gripping story, even though it's not maybe the most realistic or, or more uh, natural progression of events, it, it makes for a great, a great moment. And yeah, it does. It does make me happy that they're married in real life. Rose Leslie was perfect. I mean, one of one of my favorite characters. I think she would probably crack my top ten, Egret. That perfect combination where, yeah, she's a woman and she's playing in the man's world. And I think a lot of people have this false idea that in order to create strong female characters, then you just have to make them manly. And obviously Egret is strong and tough and... These are not traits that are exclusive to males, but she never does lose that femininity. She can be gentle, she can be sweet, she can be sympathetic and caring. Obviously, these two actors were perfect casting. The spark that they have from the very first scene that we see them together, their chemistry is incredible. These side characters are really what make the story, they really add extra weight to the story because you care for them so much, because they are so well developed. And a character like this, an actor like Rose Leslie, to say goodbye to her after three seasons. And George, like so many writers before him, was inspired by Romeo and Juliet when crafting the relationship between John and Egret. It's going to end tragically because they were born on opposite sides of the wall. And that inevitable tragedy is something that George does so well. When you know the end is coming for a certain character, but you just refuse to see the writing on the wall. It's still a gut punch when you lose her, and regardless, it's tragic for the character and for the audience, because we all loved her. Yeah, it's back-to-back two great uh, secondary characters that really bring what the essence of the show is. You know, you have your main characters, and they're great and all, but I feel like the secondary group that the show has is so strong, and they bring so much to the story, and their deaths hold just as bad as much weight as maybe like a Rob or a Cat. Yeah, no, they really do. Because I think in this moment, you get fooled when they see each other. And when she dies, it is such a quick death that it just it's a gut punch. Or a heart punch, really. (laughs) Um, But the war begins to wind down, and we have the moment where Ed is telling all of his men not to cheer. They still outnumber us 1,000 to 1. That this is just day one, presumably. And in the books, it goes on for about three or four days. In the show, it's just one night. Which you can't extend this, because the seasons aren't 15 episodes. Maybe they should have been. Then you don't have the money to make it look as good as it is. No, yeah. And then the aftermath in the courtyard. The cleanup. Such an eerie fucking setting right there all the dead bodies and you have well you have Tormund still fighting to the last minute he's not backing down he's <laughs> Who surrounded the fuck was he fighting everybody <laughs> he probably still thought he could have won he's let me at him coach but john tries to reason with them and they take him away put him in a cell and they'll go question him later but yeah the aftermath when the sun rises and it's just that night and day difference look at all this chaos that surrounded us look how many of us are left and what well, we face like not even one percent of their army <laughs> yeah like 25% of 1% of their full power. I shall throw you from the top of the wall, boy! Aye. You should have. It's ridiculous. And they're going to have more giants, like John said. They have more, and he there's nothing he could do. It's like, all right, we're going to die. If not, maybe not tonight, maybe not the next night, but pretty soon. <laughs> and I got to do something about it. 
Well, that's the plan, too, that John has. That's the only plan. Although you would think maybe take a ranging party, try to stealth your way into Mance's camp. I think that probably would have... Yeah, but John knows they have a prior relationship, and he'll see John. He'll receive him. So that's, like, the only guarantee of him actually... I mean, 100,000, how are you going to find Mance? This is, like, guarantees. Oh, John's coming. Mance will want to talk to him, and he has his opportunity right there. Yeah, cut off the head of the snake. That's really your only option. He's going to die anyway, so why not save everybody? Kill you. They'll boil you, they'll flay you, they'll make it last days. You're right. It's a bad plan. What's your plan? They held the gate. Some brothers down here to help you. That's how the episode ends. It ends with Sam opening the gate and he tells John to come back. John always comes back. But that final shot of him walking north of the wall into the white, it sets up a season where John really becomes the main character. The show is told through his perspective, and we get more focus on what's happening in the north. And it leads right into, I think, might be the second best finale besides yeah. uh, The Winds of Winter. Winds of Winter. Yeah, thinking you back, yeah, it might be. It's Could almost be. like we got three episode nines in yeah. this season. Back to back to back, all tremendous episodes, and I think so. It's a great episode, and we have all the Tyrion stuff, so I can't wait to go watch it. I wanted to watch it back to back, but I knew I'd have to watch it a third time before we reviewed it, so. Slow down. Got some self-control. 10 out of 10? Yeah. Yeah, second 10 of the season. I think so. It's not better than, like, Blackwater or anything like that, but Blackwater is just so good where... Blackwater might be my second favorite episode. Yeah, where this is not Blackwater, but it's still fucking great. It's in the top ten. Yeah. I don't know. I think I like it even more than Battle of the Bastards. And that might be sacrilegious at this point. But I think Battle of the Bastards, even though it is a masterpiece, of t- it's the most cinematic they've ever gone. But it does lack those smaller moments between characters that I think Blackwater does the best and this does the second best. Yeah, the thing about Blackwater, too, well, we already reviewed it, but it's kind of like spread out where you have the big battle going on and they cut to the calm and they go back outside to the battle where this is the calm is before the storm. Yeah, right. Battle of the Bastards is just one fucking storm. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. And it's funny, you know, I actually heard this is uh, Tommy Lahren's favorite episode of Game of Thrones. Oh, really? Yeah, something about, like, walls and people defending it really gets her rocks off. Well, you know, maybe the Night's Watch would have let them through if the Wildlings were sending their best people. Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.